let's just uh, go back to our drawing, kind of the Missoula Valley here. So I got mountain blocks. I will turn the screen back on. Mountain blocks and um, and then in between those mountain blocks, I've got an alluvial valley. And that alluvial valley is filled with sediments. All right, and I'll have cobbles and I'll have sand lenses and clay lenses. All right, and it'll be pretty heterogeneous mix of sand and cobbles. And the river sort of in the middle. All right, there's two in the world, basically, we sort of break aquifers into two basic types or basic types of groundwater systems. And the first type here is fractured systems. All right, and this would be like the mountain blocks where the main flow is coming through these fractured and fracture networks. So this would be like, here it would be the mountain blocks. And then the, uh, the second type here is, is porous. Or sedimentary. And in the sedimentary stuff, you know, it's the poor network. So flow in the poor network. All right, and that would be here, like in the Missoula Valley, it would be our alluvial aquifers. So what, like one of the first descriptors you'll hear whenever you read a groundwater paper or whatever, generally anytime, unless somebody says they're dealing with a fractured system, they're dealing with a porous system. So everybody tries to deal with porous systems because fractured bedrock sucks, all right? Um, but if you're in a fractured system, you will call out that you're in a fractured crystalline system. And in um, so by far, most of the research, most of the work in hydrology has been done in porous systems or sedimentary aquifers. So we'll discuss just some brief things about sedimentary aquifers that allow us to use the, the geologic history to understand something about what our groundwater system looks like. And this is our sort of beginnings of developing conceptual models based upon the geology. Um, so the first thing is that the depositional environment is what controls The grain size and distribution. 
So if you're in Mark's class, you know a lot about what you're what you learn about is depositional environments and what kind of sedimentary sequences we would expect to see in those depositional environments, all right? And the grain size and the grain distribution control the pore network and they control the hydraulic conductivity and storage. All right, these things control how groundwater is gonna behave. The hydraulic conductivity, the porosity, and the storage will all be controlled by the grain size and distribution. So I got a couple pictures here to look at just to sort of help us look at what some of these things look like. So this is, um, this is actually in, uh, I'd call it Northwestern Alberta, uh, but it's not really North Alberta. It just means it's North of Edmonton, which is still South in the state. Um, all right. And it's a, it's a big trench and it's just some glacial fluvial, glacial fluvial sediments and just has a bunch of beautiful stratigraphy here. So you can see things like uh, there's a really nice sand lens right here. You can see uh, a cobble, a cobble lens here. We can see that, um, you know, the degree of sorting. So this is like cobbles, but in a really sandy matrix, right? Um, and then why I took the picture is this beautiful, unbelievable contact sitting on top of this uh, much older Cretaceous shale, all right? And these, the sand and cobbles would be expected to be really permeable. And then literally like, this is like a centimeter here. You would go from very permeable to very low permeability. Right. And so you can see how heterogeneous and how the deposition sort of controls what we're what we look at in in uh, groundwater. I had one more I wanted to show here. Yeah, from Death Valley. Um, just another good side cut of what a, what some of these alluvial systems look like and just the kind of different deposition we see. So again, really big, uh, strong, sandy layer. All right. A big, thick cop, like this one's much more dominated by cobbles, this layer here in the middle. And then we've got this uh, more sandy and smaller cobble section down here. Um, and again, not super well sorted, right? Everything's got sand and cobbles. Um, all right, so just some examples of depositional environments. And as a, as a groundwater hydrologist, we would be looking at how these might control the hydraulic conductivity. And in general, the larger the grain size, the higher the hydraulic conductivity. So my guess would be that if we were to sort of study the hydraulic conductivity of this formation, this zone here with really big cobbles would be very high hydraulic conductivity. And this sandy zone here would be lower hydraulic conductivity than the rest of the sequence. Now sorting plays a, a role in changing that. And in particular, how many, what the degree of fines are. So we could, if we had a, a layer in here, like this layer in here, looks to me like it's got a fair amount of clay. I'll bet you that'd be a low hydraulic conductivity layer. Okay, so depositional environment is key in understanding how much energy there is and what the grain size is, and then how heterogeneous would we expect it to be? So in these alluvial systems, they're gonna be pretty heterogeneous. They're gonna be cobbles, sands, clays, um, but if we get into marine sequences, 
where we have large uh, sedimentary features like big beach sandstones will be much more homogeneous. Um, the other uh, key or another key um, here is that, uh, so in sedimentary aquifers, groundwater, generally follows uh, bedding. All right, so in general, uh, if we have a sedimentary sequence, uh, and the beds are sort of dipping in this direction. So I got sandstones, shales, limestones. In general, my groundwater flow systems follow bedding. All right, so they will go long bedding. So some general principles of bedding is that in general, the world, we lay down horizontal beds, right? And then we can have folding and faulting that change that. And that structure is generally what will control the flow direction in groundwater systems. In, in sedimentary aquifers. So if I have folds, if I've got faults, so folding, oh, uh, I, before we get onto folding, the reason why groundwater almost always follows the direction of bedding is if we were think about to our average hydraulic conductivity uh, in the horizontal and the vertical direction, the average hydraulic conductivity is set by the low permeability layers or the low conductivity layers in the vertical direction. And so this sequence has a very low vertical hydraulic conductivity but the average horiz horizontal hydraulic conductivity is set by the high hydraulic conductivity layers. So we have a very high average horizontal hydraulic conductivity. And that's pretty much true as long as our beds are, so groundwater follows bedding, the principal flow direction is along bedding. And that's because, uh, because the hydraulic conductivity is generally higher along bedding. This isn't always true, but it usually is. So if we have folding, like a really common sequence uh, or occurrence, and we'll look at this in Eastern Montana, is a structural basin, which is a syncline. This is a basin or syncline. 
And uh, this is, let's say our land surface does something like this. In general, our groundwater flow will go along bedding. From uh, generally from high topography to low topography, this drawing is horrible, so you can't see that this is actually higher topography over here. So I'm going to change that. So in general, we have flow in these along bedding and we almost never have like a homogenous sequence. The world is set up to these layers of sedimentary layers. And so we, we have alternating systems of aquifers and confining units that follow the bedding. So you can see already that Toth's model of a really thick homogeneous system is probably never going to be the case. So in folding, groundwater follows structure. And this can happen for both a, uh, a syncline or an anticline. So if I've got, if I've got layering in the subsurface, sandstone, shale, sandstone, right? And this is now an anticline. Then the groundwater flow will generally flow up and over the anticline and back down. All right, that will be our general flow direction that we would expect. And let's say this is covered by a confining unit. This is in fact important because you know, in these big regional groundwater flow systems, they'll go over an anticline if they have any hydrocarbons in them, they release the hydrocarbons and you develop your oil and gas trap right there. So oil and gas traps are delivered by regional groundwater flow um, in uh, anticlines often. Well, oil and gas is lighter than, generally it's less dense than water. And so it tends to rise to the top of the groundwater flow, flow path and accumulate. This is an, a confining unit. So the liquids don't wanna move upward through it. And so they accumulate in the high, in the uh, structural high. So they sort of just slowly dissolve out of the groundwater system and accumulate up into the structural high. When they do that here, they would hit the barrier and then navigate this way. Okay, so um, in general, and we'll see this in, in uh, we'll look at uh, groundwater in Montana, um, as an example of this, I don't know if we'll get to get to it today, uh, but after the test, we'll look at it. And you'll see that um, in general, in these sedimentary systems, 
groundwater flow follows the sedimentary structure. Um, and so knowing the structure as much as we can know it is really important for us developing our conceptual model. Um, and so your first, almost always our first step in building a conceptual model for groundwater is building a geologic model. Uh, okay, let's switch gears and talk about, uh, now let's, um, it's not, now, um, let's talk about faults, which are complicated. So a common, a common occurrence might be that we're, uh, we've got some structure that's dipping. All right, and then we intersect a fault and our bedding is offset. So here's the land surface. And this is a shale. This sandstone uh, shale sandstone Okay, so our groundwater flow follows the structure. All right, and it flows down the bedding until it hits the fault. And the question is, what happens here at the fault? And faults kind of have two behaviors. So faults can either be a high K all right so if a fault has high hydraulic conductivity then the water would tend to hit the fault and actually just follow it up to the surface And in that case, faults can uh, direct a discharge. All right, so it is it is the case where where you'll have springs or enhanced groundwater discharge along faults. That it that can be the case. The other option is that the fault is low K, in which case this ends up being a flow barrier. And the water will take the shortest path across the fault if it moves across it at all. So some, some faults are such low conductivity that they'll just 
mean that there's no circulation through this groundwater flow system. It's, it's trapped right here when it hits the fault. If it can, it'll leak just as fast through the fault as it can to get uh, into the high hydraulic conductivity zone again. So faults are, it's unclear. When you know there's a fault, it could either be a low conductivity zone or a high hydraulic conductivity zone. And in many cases, in most cases, it appears that these big faults are both. In some locations, they're high hydraulic conductivity. In some locations, they're low hydraulic conductivity. So it's often both, depending on location.